on there? Not yet? Mm -hmm. you're, you're on the air, guys. It says yes. live. <laughs> yes. Now I, now I can figure now, it. Now we see it. Now okay. we see it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hi everyone. Uh, hello, hello, internet. Hello, world. Uh, this is uh, Cian from Mr. For Cian from the Blockchainers. Mr. Blockchain. Oh, okay, and this is Tristan from Mr. Blockchain and Blog Arts. This is Tony from Mr. Blockchain and Blog Art. And, and then we have a very special guest. Please introduce yourself, special guest. Uh, I am special guest Jimmy Song. I yeah. <laughs> Jimmy Song, my cousin uh i guess so i don't know <laughs> i'm sure we're all cousins right there aren't that many korean people in the world so yeah yes and koreans are dominating the market so we have uh jimmy joining us for this uh very special show before he comes over to korea to do his uh special programming blockchain mm -hmm. and um yeah i think a lot of people are going to be tuning in tonight today or they'll, they'll be at least watching this like several times yeah over and over again definitely yeah. when they see jimmy song on the title I didn't. I didn't realize I had any kind of fame over there, but that's great. I'm also that that I, I'm 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 very awfully pleased. Yeah, I'm I'm very happy about that. Yeah. So how was uh, how was your uh, keynote over at Token uh, Two Forty Nine? Yeah. So I spoke about why is Bitcoin anti fragile. Um, a lot of people liked it. Uh, Craig S. Wright went right after me, and he got like no applause, and nobody wanted to take pictures with him or anything. So I feel very proud that. I didn't have to deal with Craig Wright. Uh, he came into the speaker's room like, like as I was about to go on, I left immediately. I did not want to be in the same room with that guy. I think he's a complete scammer. Um, and people that, uh, I mean, he's like defrauded the Australian government out of money and stuff like that. So anyway, I, I was very happy with the fact that I didn't have to interact with him at all. I, um, and you know, it's good. I, I, I'm, yeah, I, I, it, anyway, the talk went well. It's about anti-fragility. If you don't know what that is, uh, there's a book by Nassib Taleb that's really good, Anti-Fragile. It's about things that gain from disorder. Um, fragile things are things that break easily or whatever. They don't like disorder. So a vase is fragile. And the opposite of fragile is not robust, which is like immune to sort of disorder, but something that actually gains or strengthens from disorder. And I argue in my talk that you know, Bitcoin is something that gains from disorder. It, it actually gets better every time there are disordering events. And, uh, and it went over pretty well. Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe I, I'm supposed to speak at like the Seoul Bitcoin meetup on Sunday, possibly. And if that does happen, then, uh, then maybe I'll give that talk again or something like that. Yeah, I mean, like, definitely. I mean, like, a lot of people are talking about the core value of Bitcoin. I mean, can I ask you about, like, what's Jimmy Song's perspective? How do you see Bitcoin as? What is the core value of it? Is it like okay. a store of value? Is that it? Yeah. So uh, my friend Safety Namas, he's, uh, he's a Lebanese economics professor. He's uh, releasing a book called The Bitcoin Standard. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's got uh, the preface or the foreword written by uh, Nassib Taleb, who's also Lebanese. You know, so like I, th I think they know each other and stuff like that. But I, I got to preview the book. He asked me to like sort of critique it, uh, especially like some of the Bitcoin parts and stuff. Uh, and that book crystallized for me what I see as the core value proposition of Bitcoin. And it's sound money. A lot of people sort of tend to not think about money until it's it, it sort of like disappears or whatever. And uh, but I, I say that and speaking sort of as a technical guy. When, when I see money and sort of studying it and, uh, you know, what it's done over the years and stuff like that, Bitcoin is the base layer of civilization. You cannot have civilization without money. And, uh, and, and money and sound money in particular makes for a very prosperous uh, civilization. As a tech guy, um, you know, when, when you think about like uh, web servers, for example, right, they have to live on some sort of OS. And, uh, you know, if you use something like Apache or Nginx, that's going to do way better uh, on Linux versus something like IAS on Windows. And any normal web developer kind of knows this stuff. Uh, but if you sort of like broaden that horizon and think about sort of society in general and civilization, uh, sound money ends up becoming this very, very important thing. And, and the book that I'm telling you about, The Bitcoin Standard by, by uh, Safety Enormous, it, it, it really crystallizes why sound money is just so important. 
And, uh, and part of that is because people are allowed to save. You can't have it inflated away from you. You can't be ta taxed away from you, confiscated away from you, just because the government does not like what you are doing. And, and Bitcoin is that sound money, right? Like we had that in the 1800s. Um, and, uh, and America in particular, uh, you know, produced, uh, you know, unprecedented prosperity. It went from a backwater British colony to a world superpower in about 100 years, 1800 to 1900. Uh, the last century, you know, it's like 1917. It's been more or less riding on the tails of the success of the 1800s. And, uh, you know, the innovations that came out in the 1800s, like, you know, the railroads, uh, steam engine, uh, steel, uh, modern manufacturing techniques and things like that. All of that came as a result of, uh, you know, civilization being based on sound money. And I, I can sort of see that happening with Bitcoin, right? I don't know about you guys, but I have friends that got into Bitcoin and suddenly they started thinking about saving. There were people like that, that would live paycheck to paycheck. Suddenly they start caring about saving money. They're like, okay, well, I don't need to buy that popcorn, right? I could buy like $5 of Bitcoin, you know, and, and, and that ends up being a very good decision. And being able to save for the future, having a long-term perspective instead of short-term perspective, uh, that's very powerful. That allows people to sort of add to society. And instead of doing like rent-seeking jobs where you're doing these zero-sum games, instead you're, you have sort of like this abundance mentality where you're trying to benefit society and make something that people will like. And, uh, and you know, it, it, you, you're, you're creating and making things that are useful. That's what Bitcoin allows. For me, that is the core value of Bitcoin. It's gonna become the new base layer of civilization. And if you don't believe that this will have an effect, take a look at Venezuela, take a look at Zimbabwe. And they, these places are, are where you end up when you have a fiat money system, when you have, uh, you know, play, when you have a very bad base layer, um, and you know the U U.S. dollar is also a fiat currency. European euro is a fiat currency. Korean won, the Japanese yen, whatever it is, they're all fiat right now. And uh, you know, the, it just fragilizes the system. And you know, this this is why I'm very passionate about Bitcoin and talking about it. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. I agree with you on the fact that it is sound money and there's uh, the ability for uh, people to uh, be independent from from the government and then be able to, you know, keep their wealth, right? And then to protect their wealth is definitely a plus uh, plus for Bitcoin. But my my, I guess I'm going to play a little bit of the devil's advocate here. But at the same time, I would argue that the relative utility of Bitcoin the, the utility value of Bitcoin actually varies from place to place. So, for example, yeah. like in Zimbabwe or Venezuela, Bitcoin uh -huh. is way more, much more valuable than it is uh -huh. in the, f say, for example, the United States or in Korea. And this yeah, is just yeah. by just by virtue of um, just the dire situations that they're placed in. Right. And that makes this this thing that you could keep with like a like a brain wallet or like mnemonic, mnemonic seed right in your head. Like and the government can't take it away take it away from you so how do you view that like because you're supposed because all of a sudden we're thrust into this um this thing where you know a single bitcoin has different spending power depending on which part of the world you're in i mean that's that already existed but you're, you kind of have to live with that so how do you how do you see it in that light yeah i mean i that's absolutely true and i, I don't know if we're disagreeing on anything uh as far as i'm concerned that is a natural phenomenon that happens in sort of economics the u.s dollar has more purchasing power in different areas of the world especially Venezuela and Zimbabwe. And, uh, you know, the people in those places, you ask them, what, would you rather spend your 100 Bolivian bolivars or, you know, one US dollar? They're going to say the bolivars, of course, because it has more, you know, it's going to degrade. It's going to be confiscated. It's going to be inflated. It's going to be taxed away. It's going to be whatever. And, uh, and they know what good, good money is, what, what bad money is. So that's not a surprise to me at all. And, that, and you should sort of, uh, expect sort of jaggedness as far as like purchasing power. It's not going to be uniform or um, or like consistent across all domains. That's that's just the natural natural function of money. And you know the uh, sensitive to sort of the conditions of a particular place uh, or time and place of uh, wherever it is. And, and and that's normal. I will say though that the U.S. dollar has been going down in purchasing power 
And you can see that in all sorts of asset inflation. You can see real estate, stocks and equities, all, all those things have been inflating uh, in, in large part because the purchasing power has been going down because the governments are like printing enormous amounts of money through quantitative easing or raising the debt ceiling or whatever it is. Um, that tends to be the way it happens. Um, and, you know, there's all sorts of leverage being applied to all sorts of assets that never really had them before. And uh, there's, uh, it, you know, and when you fractionally reserve some of this stuff or like take something illiquid and make it liquid, uh, you know, based on stuff like that, it, it, it tends to inflate the economy significantly. So that's what the world we face since around 2008. Um, and this is why true digital scarcity like Bitcoin becomes very, very important. It's an enforced hard scarcity, and that, that's a very good thing. Yes, uh, definitely. There is a core value of Bitcoin in that perspective. However, others are actually saying that when we are doing the transactions, is Bitcoin able to accommodate all those transactions at the, that speed and transaction fees and scalability issues? Do you guys, yeah. do you, what are your thoughts on scalability issues here? I think they're completely overblown. Um, and uh, the thing is, if you are a business, right, uh, you do care about transaction capacity. And uh, not many people know this, but businesses take up 80, 90 percent of every block. Uh, and that's just the reality because they do most of the, you know, like day to day uh, like transactions back and forth with other businesses, with users, stuff like that. They are m most of the block uh, size increase or uh, block um, consumers. But uh, what happened with the New York agreement was that they wanted sort of like the easiest, laziest way to scale. And if you are a business, you're thinking next six months and not thinking next five, 10 years. I think a lot of developers and users in particular sort of uh, take a much longer view and want things to scale properly. And when you have something like the Lightning Network, when you have something like, um, you know, side chains or uh, other off chain second, third layer solutions, you, you get that scalability uh, and it, you can get like four or five orders of magnitude, 10,000 10, X instead of 10 X uh, on, on this stuff. Um, you know, the people that, you know, and even then it's like, are people really going to use it? Like, uh, you know, I gave that an analogy with, uh, with the Venezuelan Boulevard and the US dollar. You know, I, I, uh, I, I, when I spend money, I tend to use US dollars first. Why? Because I want to keep my Bitcoin. The people that are spending it, 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 people generally don't like to spend assets that are going up in value. And that's just natural hum human you know, instinct. They, they know what is going to keep in value versus what's going to be inflated away. Uh, so, you know, they, they spend the bad money. This is called Gresham's Law in economics. Good money drives out bad. The people will spend the bad money first. And that, that, that's just logic right and that's that and you can uh, how many of you do that right like i spent uh a uh, hundred dollars on beef jerky back in 2013 right and that that this was when bitcoin was four hundred dollars and that beef jerky was good but it wasn't it wasn't that good right like this, i look at it now that's like two thousand two hundred fifty dollars it wasn't two thousand two hundred fifty dollars worth of beef jerky like it, it it's you 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 regret end up uh, you regret spending that stuff, uh, and this is part of the thing that you have to think about when most people are using it as a store of value. There are a few people like Rick Falfini or whatever. He he's like all in on Bitcoin. He's been since like three dollars or something, so he constantly has to spend Bitcoin. So of course he's pissed off that you know like blocks are full or he has to pay large fees or whatever because he's all in. But you know, like you can't, those aren't the only people. The vast majority of people that are in Bitcoin, they're using it as a store of value. They want to hold it for a long time. Uh, and you know, that, that's their investment thesis. Uh, and not, you know, buying coffee or pizza or whatever it is on the blockchain. Most people don't brag about that. They're not saying, hey, look what I bought with Bitcoin today. You know, like that's not what they're talking about. It's look at the Bitcoin price. I have some Bitcoin. And this is what's cool, you know, like these are the things that you talk about with uh, with your Bitcoin friends. It tells you exactly what people are using it for. And uh, and store of value is a very, very important function because it's something that will store value. True digital scarcity allows for this. And uh, and that's the major innovation of Bitcoin that a lot of people don't really appreciate. 
So as you just mentioned, you said you, you mentioned about the store value. Mm -hmm. uh, and others are also saying that the problems of scalability issues and the high transaction fee doesn't actually have to be solved because it is the main thing about the Bitcoin is a store of value. And why do we have to actually ruin this, you know? So are you actually saying that we do not actually have to solve the scalability issues and high transaction fee? I mean, I, I, I mean, they're kind of solved, solved themselves, right? Like for a lot of people were panicking in December. Right now you can get like sub Satoshi trans, per byte transactions in, you know, that's like three or four cents. Like you can, you can, you can, you can do transactions for really, really cheap. Uh, even, even free sometimes, uh, and depending on what it is. Um, and this is because those businesses that take up 80, 90% of a block, they, they uh, implemented SegWit or add, like did transaction batching or whatever it is that reduce their block usage. And it only takes a little bit of, uh, uh, of optimization to basically lower, uh, uh, lower block size, block consumption to the point where there's now like no transaction backlog whatsoever. And like, you know, fees get really, really low. Now, is, does that have to stay there forever? No, absolutely not. I, and, you know, there will come a day when, you know, there may be, you know, ways to scale or whatever that, that become a major part of Bitcoin. And I think Lightning may be it, maybe it's side chains, maybe it's like a complete third party thing. Whatever it is, I, I, I'm not that concerned because the people that panic over high fees, they're really only looking at the short term. And, and the thing is, these things are temporary. You know, same thing with like minor centralization or whatever. People are like, hey, you know what? Like Bitmain has all that, all that mining power. It's not gonna stay the same, guys. Like the, Bitmain made like three or $4 billion last year. You think Samsung's gonna like make, let, let them keep all that profit? You think Intel's thinking that? You think Nvidia? All, the, all these companies are going to look at the fact that Bitmain has made all of this money and go, okay, how do we get some of this juice? And as Bitcoin goes up in price, the, the economic motivations to disrupt Bitmain are going to, going, going to explode. Same thing with like any sort of transaction uh, fee, fee stuff. Soon as it gets to a certain point, it, it, it changes the behavior of all of the participants so that they can get in on, on some of this stuff. If you have like off, an off-chain transaction and you can char charge half, you can make money. I mean, th this is where the problems are the fertile ground from which entrepreneurship happens. And that's, that's a really good thing, not a bad thing like people tend to make it. You don't have to have the status quo. You can have innovation, and this is a very good thing. Okay, so I see um, storing value in Bitcoin is very important, but let's, let, let us have a broader view. Instead mm -hmm. of having Bitcoin focused, we can mm -hmm. focus on a blockchain technology because we have different blockchains. So why does it have to be Bitcoin instead of Ethereum? Because there are other coins that we can store values in it. Uh -huh. Well, you can sort of, well, first of all, Ethereum was never meant to be a store of value. You, and their developers will plainly tell you that their inflation schedule goes to infinity. They have a constant inflation all, uh, all throughout, no matter proof of work, no matter proof of stake or whatever. And they will tell you we are oil to Bitcoin's gold. Oil is something that gets used or consumed or whatever. And they'll tell you we're supposed to be a world computer or some sort of contract platform or whatever. And uh, that's very different value property. But regardless of that, the big thing about Bitcoin that makes it different than every other altcoin is that it's decentralized. All of these other coins have a creator. Charlie Lee, Litecoin, right? Uh, Fluffy didn't do uh, Monero, but he's the lead developer there. You have, um, you know, Zuko on Zcash. You have Laramar on Steam or whatever. There, there, there's a creator that gets to set the agenda. There's a creator that gets to bail people out if they want to. That, that essentially is the governance for that coin. And the fact that they have that makes it weaker because it takes away all of the value proposition of a, of a blockchain. The idea is that it's not supposed to be centralized. There's not supposed to be one single point of failure. Right now, if you go, go and kidnap Vitalik, you could probably get and, you know, like threaten his family or something like that. You could get, you could get probably whatever you want. You could, you could go and say, okay, we want to bail out all those people that lost money in that stupid smart contract that some, some person was able to like go, go, and, go and hack or whatever. 
you could do that. You could do that. And it, it, it would, it, whatever Vitalik says, he, he's probably going to get. That's a centralized point of failure. It's not really a, a very good store of value. If there's a central point that can issue more stuff, confiscate, that can do, do all of these things. How is it different than fiat at that point? Bitcoin is different because it is not controlled by a central party. One of the greatest things that Satoshi Nakamoto did was disappear because that allowed Bitcoin to become a decentralized thing. And that's a very, very good thing and something that a lot of people don't appreciate. And that's, that, that makes Bitcoin different than all of these other things that, uh, you know, they try to pretend that it's very similar. No, it's not. It, it definitely is not. And you cannot store value in something that's not as good as store value. Yeah, as you just mentioned about the uh, different uh, coins, uh, I want to ask you about the uh, consensus algorithm over this, these different coins. As you mentioned, Larimer of, of the DPoS and Vitaly uh, going forward POS. Are there a lot of different uh, uh, consensus algorithms right now? Why do you think POW is the one that actually uh, gains or acquire us uh, the decentralized ecosystem? Well, so first of all, proof of stake is not proven at all. I, I, I wrote a series of tweets about, uh, you know, why proof of stake doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, proof of stake is more, if you don't know what it is, it's basically you stake some coins or lock up your coins for some amount. And there, there's some sort of random decision making about who gets to uh, basically get some coins as a result and or create blocks. And as a reward for creating the block, you get some reward or something like that. Uh, first of all, it's not secure, right? Like, there's no security. There's no hard problem that's asymmetric like proof of work. It's just, let's just choose somebody and then they can go do whatever. And that, that randomness can be manipulated in some way. Then you can, you can do stake grinding or whatever. But more importantly, economically, it's, it's exactly the same equation as proof of work. In order for proof of stake to work, the, the cost of creating a block to get that reward is some amount, right? Like the cost of uh, the, the reward of a block is say, like right now in Bitcoin, it's 12 and a half Bitcoin. Say Bitcoin switch, switch to proof of stake. Well, if I'm a rational miner, I should be willing to spend up to 12.5 Bitcoin in order to get that proof of stake. And that could be anything, any action that costs up to 12.4 or 12.5, I should be willing to do. That's just economic rationality doesn't matter what the actual action is. It could be DDoSing people. It could be threatening their families. I don't know. It could be, you know, stake grinding. It could be whatever. It, it, it gets as creative as people want it to be. But the equation stays the same. The actual amount spent is going to be a little bit less than the reward. With proof of work, you know exactly where that comes from. With proof of stake, it's completely hidden. And transparency has some value, right? You, you, you want to know where it comes from and you want to know that it, it, it's, it's secure as well. So for me, proof of work is vastly superior to proof of stake. Distributed proof of stake to me is very much like privileged nodes. And then you have the problem of, well, you have these privileged nodes, how do you decide which ones are privileged? Uh, like Dash, I think uh, they, they sell those like nodes that that basically are the uh, yeah like complete like scam or whatever to like make a lot of money for those people that own it or whatever it it, it doesn't make any sense to me uh it, it, if you're if you're decentralized proof of work works and you you know exactly where the energy comes from you know exactly how much it costs or or you have at least a very good idea with proof of stake it's hidden it's not secure uh so you know, I mean, like Bram Cohen's working on proof of space and time. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know, but every, everything ends up being proof of work. There's an article written by Paul Stork. Uh, he wrote it a few years ago based on this. You can go take a look at it on truthcoin.info. Really good information. It's, uh, the article is a little bit technical, but he's trained as an economist. He has a PhD in economics, uh, and he talks about it from an economic perspective. Uh, oftentimes, when people think about proof of stake, what they do is they just look at the last mile. Oh, I'm not wasting electricity, so therefore I'm a good person. Uh, no, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. It's a, it's like a lot of people say that about driving electric cars. No, it doesn't make you a good person either. Uh, and you have no idea where that electricity came from. 
it could come from a coal power plant that's like, you know, polluting the environment way more. You know, like don't feel good just because you're doing this last thing. You have to, you have to take into account the unseen. Economics is the science of uh, figuring out the cost of the unseen things and the opportunity costs and the things that never happened or what, what, what could have happened. And that's, uh, you know, like we have a bias against that as humans. You know, and, and that's more or less what people are referring to with proof of stake or why people like it. Okay. I, I'm personally of the opinion that people like what's new and shiny without trying to understand what's been there before. And, you know, like so one of the things that's really interesting about Bitcoin is like what you said, like proof of work came out in the 90s, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember listening to like Adam Beck's um, a podcast from like back in like 2014 i think it was a let's talk bitcoin podcast and already there he was talking about range proofs so he was already thinking of like schnorr signatures and confidential transactions at that point in time so um in the in terms of like what's what's in the pipeline right now for uh bitcoin since we got like segwit out of the way uh masked and schnorr signatures and you know confidential transactions are you looking forward to these and how will they improve the current bitcoin experience yeah, so um, I, I'm actually doing uh, a talk at the Hong Kong Dev Meetup uh, in like a few days about Shure signatures, um, Blair Nevin signatures, and uh, music. All of those are really exciting because you can have a level of privacy about your transaction, gain a lot of uh, sort of like block space back for multi-sig. Um, you know, make, make single signatures look like... Uh, like make signal, single signatures from lots of signatures. Really, really exciting stuff. And you can't tell by looking at the blockchain whether or not there were multi-sig or, or, or single-sig. And so those things are really cool. Um, I, you know, there, there's a lot of stuff coming down the pike in that, in that way. Uh, you know, they're talking about better fee estimation algorithms, uh, taproot, graphroot. These are all sort of privacy-preserving script elements, or uh, you can sort of... Think of them as uh, smart contract improvements to Bitcoin, uh, and and these are these are really cool. They're actually useful, unlike Ethereum's current completeness. Everyone talks about that, but you look at every contract. ERC20 tokens don't use any Turing completeness at all, and they act like it's like this like amazing thing. It's like it, 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 there's no innovation there. Nobody uses it. Anybody that's used it, uh, you know, gets burned, right? Like uh, the DAO used a lot of Turing completeness. Guess what? It was insecure, right? Like, uh, it's, it's very, uh, and, and for good reason. You don't want to use Turing completeness because it's like actually very difficult to prove that something is secure when you use loops and things like that. Whereas with Bitcoin, it's a very limited language, so you know exactly what's going, on, what, what's going to happen. You can prove things. That's a very good thing. So uh, things that, quote, unquote, are features are not really. Um, so you have to be very careful about that. But yeah. There's a, there's a lot of cool things coming down the pike. Um, I expect a lot of privacy preserving features. Uh, we'll probably get, get towards confidential transactions at some point. Uh, you know, bulletproofs are very exciting because, you know, rage proofs are like many kilobytes uh, per like proving very, very small things. The bulletproofs, you can get it down to like 32 bytes. Awesome stuff, awesome stuff. Yeah, it, it, I like what you said about privacy, you know, like the slew of projects that come out, it usually means it's usually a response to like something that's, you know, so a problem that we're facing in the crypto ecosystem. And, you know, like yesterday or today, news came out that NSA has been tracking Bitcoin users, right? Like that's the oh, yeah. big thing. So they just dropped the bomb on us. And like, oh. I, I think this year there will be a lot of attempts at trying to put a lot of e existing legal systems around Bitcoin. So what, what do you think about this? Like. Bitcoin, you know, like the thing of Bitcoin is like, you're not supposed to be able to control it. It's supposed to be something that's designed to be unstoppable, right? Unlike mm -hmm. Ethereum's uh, unstoppable code. So do you think, will regulation be able to control something which was originally designed to be uncon uncontrollable? Well, regulation really just controls people. And, uh, and there are people in Bitcoin, so it's possible to control them through regulation somewhat. Uh, but that said, it's it's hard to go after lots and lots of individuals, and you end up with like communism, where you're like jailing people, like individuals, and lots of arbitrariness, and that way lies madness, and you usually end up with revolution and you know all sorts of societal upheaval, which I don't think uh, either any of the governments in the world really have that much of an appetite for. Uh, I, so regulation's like one of those tricky things. Um, 
I don't know. I, I, it's possible uh, that they can make draconian things. I have friends that like argue constantly that you know you govern at some point governments are gonna put a big dent in Bitcoin. You know, China's banned Bitcoin like thirty different times. No, nobody really cares anymore. You know, who, who, you know, it's it's all good. Uh, I, I I wouldn't worry too much about it on a long enough time horizon. I think Bitcoin outlasts a lot of governments anyway. Okay. Sure. Yeah, uh, and one more thing. Uh, there are a lot of things going on right now uh, regarding the financial products of mm -hmm. the Bitcoin. Uh, what are your thoughts on Bitcoin futures trading on CME, CBOA, and more? And a lot of people mentioned about the in institution's uh, intervention into cryptocurrency can ruin the decentralized ecosystem that we wanted. Uh, what are your thoughts on Bitcoin's introduction to futures trading and the other uh, financial products that has been uh, getting ready for us? Yeah, and these are these are all more or less like uh, respond to market de demand. A lot of people want exposure to this space, and there's no easy, real way to do it without like dealing with all the custody issues of Bitcoin. By having futures and options and things like that, you can sort of uh, sidestep a lot of the custody issues. Uh, you'll notice that a lot of futures are cash settled. That means that you don't have to deal with custody at all because you just pay in cash whatever the thing is worth. Uh, I mean, I suppose it's good, but I don't think very much about them because they're not really Bitcoin. Will it affect the price a little bit? Probably. But over the long term, you actually have to have possession for it to actually really be worth something. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't see these things affecting Bitcoin very much. Uh, it's possible institutions, uh, you know, get in more on uh, based on this stuff. And institutions are people, too. You know, there, there are people that are involved in it. There are funds uh, that are family offices or pensions or whatever. Ultimately, it comes down to people. And people like Bitcoin and they want exposure. So it's going to happen. Um, how it does and exactly in what form, I don't know. Uh, but, you know, it's pretty safe to say it's going to be uh, something that'll stick around and be a part of things for years to come. So speaking of China, we'll have to talk about Bitcoin Cash, I guess. We have a lot of forks from Bitcoins. We have now Bitcoin Diamonds. We have Bitcoin something, whatever. Uh, so what makes Bitcoin different than other ones? Like, I guess uh, they they say that they're most advanced Bitcoin with a larger block size. So what's on your thoughts? Well, so first of all, a lot of these Bitcoin forks have almost the exact same code as Bitcoin. Right? They tweak a few current parameters, um, and a lot of the developers aren't competent enough to like backport a lot of the changes that, that are constantly coming. Uh, so as far as I know, Bitcoin Diamond is sort of stuck on 0 0.15. 0 0.16 has been released for you know like a month now, but you know none of none of those features are in Bitcoin Diamond, for example. And a lot of altcoins, frankly, are the same way. They forked off of Bitcoin or used a lot of the Bitcoin code starting at like, I don't know, 0 0.7 or something like that. And they haven't really uh, kept up to date with all of the improvements that Bitcoin has made. So number one, Bitcoin has superior technology. Um, it may be similar up to a certain point as far as the code base is concerned. But after a certain point, the developers just aren't as good as Bitcoin. Secondly, uh, the other big thing that's different is exactly what I said about all coins. Bitcoin is actually decentralized. Bitcoin Cash, it's Amory Sachet, uh, Betel Mix on, uh, on GitHub. That's all it is. Bitcoin Gold, there's like two or three developers around the world uh, that are funded by Jack, what's his name? Um, there's also, uh, you know, Bitcoin Diamond, it's funded by some guy in China. Super Bitcoin, there's a guy funding it in China. You guys probably see a pattern. A lot of these guys come out of China. But yeah, regardless, they're all centralized, right? Like, who the hell cares? Like, if it's a centralized coin, it's not Bitcoin. It's not decentralized, it's not very different than fiat. And you could see that because like Bitcoin gold, like pre mined or mid mined like a ton of coins for themselves so that they could keep it. And each developer got like $200,000 of like Bitcoin cash value, uh, you know, because, you know, that was what, what they gave them for whatever. Like it, it, it's, it's all kind of very scammy to me. And it's, a, it's, it's not in the spirit of Bitcoin or what the market is interested in. And you could see that in the hard for prices. Uh, you know, even a month ago, they were trading a lot higher and uh, most of them have dropped 80, 90 percent. And I know this because I, I've done hard fork splits for a lot of clients. They'll give me their seeds after they move their Bitcoin and I'll like sell it for them. 
in January I was making tons of money. Now it's like a fraction of that because uh, these ports have dropped so much in price. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's the difference. So this is actually a question from the viewer. So uh -huh. he's holding Bitcoin and also the same amount of Bitcoin cash. And uh -huh. he's a fan of both. So uh -huh. he's asking you, are there going to be any coordination between Bitcoin cash and Bitcoin? Probably Is it just not. political issues? Yeah, I mean, probably not. I, I know that Bitcoin cash constantly sort of like that course Bitcoin changes. In fact, like I was pissed off at Dental Nix because he, uh, he told people that I was contributing to Bitcoin cash when he was just backporting one of my changes into Bitcoin core. Uh, but, you know, that, that sort of thing happens. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, but yeah, as far as uh, Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin Core coordinating, probably not. There was some suggestion at some point about Bitcoin Cash merge mining with Bitcoin Core uh, or Bitcoin, uh, you know, us utilizing some minor stuff. That's possible and that can be sort of done unilaterally with uh, Bitcoin Cash developers plus some miners. So maybe that's what happens. I don't know, but I, I don't see any sort of like, coordination in the future. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit about uh, developer culture. Um, uh -huh. So I do uh, JavaScript development, and uh -huh. I this is just like me, me just drawing like crazy parallels. So take, uh -huh. please take this with a grain of salt. Uh -huh. I feel like Bitcoin is like the the Linux cult developer culture, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then like Ethereum has more of like the JavaScript. Like, um, so Bitcoin, it seems like it's tough love, right? Like you gotta uh -huh. earn, you gotta earn your stripes. You gotta prove you gotta prove that you know. You're, you're the man that you say you are, and then and then you get you get the respect. Am I correct in making this kind of assessment? And uh, is this is this like what what why what you said about like Bitcoin has the best developers? Is that where that? Yeah, comes from? yeah, I, absolutely. I, I mean, you you have like I I I went to a Bitcoin like core dev meetup. They have them every six months or so, and uh, I went to one like last month. And it's like uh, you know it was like forty people all over the world. A lot of them, like, you wouldn't know their names or whatever. I, I feel like I know a lot of them, and I knew only, like, 15 or 20 people in the room. There were a bunch of people I didn't know, had never met, and they're from all over the world, Australia, you know, like, Europe and Asia and all, all over the place, right? Like, uh, and, and they're all, like, really, really good developers. Uh, you know, we, we'd be talking about, like, some uh, detail of how you prove that uh, Bel Air Nevin signature works or how you verify it or something like that and you know pretty much everyone could like recite exactly why and stuff like that really really good developer and you know like it is a culture of meritocracy and you know they they're the ones that are on twitter that like sort of insult people that's not what most of the developers are like if you if you contribute to core most of them are extremely kind people very helpful people Peter Woolis still goes on Bitcoin.stock exchange and answers like five, ten questions a day. You, you could get help from Peter Woolis himself. You know, he's, he's like a, a, an amazing person. Whereas like, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, Ethereum and stuff like that, you know, it is true. They're all about unicorns and whatever. Like, I don't know why they dress like that. It's just like completely confusing. To me. Wait, wait. Come on, man. I don't, I don't like, and you know, they, they tend to skew younger, maybe more liberal. I don't know, but uh, they, they tend to be more socialist or something like that. I, I don't, I don't really understand it. Uh, but yeah, they have a different developer culture, let's just say, uh, probably one that's not as focused on security. Their thing is getting out new features that nobody uses. Um, but yeah, I, who, who knows? Maybe, maybe that's, maybe that works for them. I don't know. Yeah, and then this will make a nice segue into uh, programming blockchain. Uh -huh. So you are doing, you're obviously doing programming blockchain, and one of you've explicitly mentioned that it's because of uh, developer shortages that we're experiencing in Bitcoin and every other blockchain project. Mm -hmm. And uh, please explain to our viewers who are listening at home how uh, programming blockchain fits into all this. Yeah, so uh, the, this is something that I identified a long time ago. The biggest risk to Bitcoin is that there aren't enough developers. And uh, somebody estimated that for every nine Bitcoin developer openings, uh, there's only one developer available <laughs> to fill it. And the thing is, like with Bitcoin developers, uh, you, have, you have a couple of problems. First, most of them are already kind of rich, so they don't have to work. <laughs> 
right? And so they, they, they do this because they like it. And I, a lot of these ICOs have a hell of a time trying to like hire these guys because like they're, they're trying to like sell them on their crappy project. And it's like, why would I work on your crappy project? I don't need to work. You have to convince me that it's worthwhile and good for the world than not just lining your freaking pockets. Uh, the other thing is that a lot of these developers want a lot of control, right? Uh, and they, they want to be a part of it. You can't just be like, okay, here's our project. We're going to pay you this amount. Uh, you know, and, and that, that doesn't work. It, you can't do that with this group. So, you know, I, I want to fill that gap. I want to make sure that there's a lot of developers to go around. I always joke with my students, like, I'll always have lots of students to teach because they'll graduate out as uh, Bitcoin increases in price and they go start sipping pina coladas on a beach somewhere. And that, that, that's always good, right? Like there's, there's always a, a demand for Bitcoin developers. And what I'm trying to do is to create more of them. When what, I, uh, what I teach over two days is uh, Bitcoin development. I, ta I, I teach them a competent Python developer how to program Bitcoin. They're going to make their own Bitcoin library from scratch, starting with finite fields and elliptic curves and elliptic curve cryptography, signing and verification, transaction parsing, transaction verification, transaction creation, locks, lock parsing, proof of work calculations, networking, SegWit, all of this stuff I cover and they make their own, uh, in the middle of the second day, they make their own uh, test that transaction where they redeem the uh, test that coins that I send them the night before. So it's a, it's a really good program. I've had a lot of uh, good feedback. It, it, it is like a fire hose of information. So over two days, you get more or less a semester's worth of information. And I, and I don't joke about that. There, uh, the University of Texas has, uh, has approached me about creating a Bitcoin course where I would teach and the same exact material over an entire semester. And I, I, I think it would be, it would still be a tough class. So not easy by any means, but it's, a, it's the fastest way to make these things, make, make Bitcoin developers. And that's my mission here. Yeah. What kind of scares, uh, not, yeah, scares me like a big hur hur hurdle is not just Bitcoin. I think it's uh, the C++. <laughs> <laughs> right because like that's that's one of those languages that you have to put in like at least 10 that language by itself is you gotta you gotta you know yeah you know you don't have to do that though like i i teach my class in python for a reason it's it's very easy to learn and uh it's a very good teaching language and to be a core contributor you don't have to know c plus plus a large part of the testing framework is written in python uh and you know some of the zmq stuff like if you just know like some of the library um, you can you can do you can contribute in different ways, so it's okay. C plus plus tends to be a very performant language, but you know there's lots of parts of the ecosystem that are in different languages. Bitcoin J is in Java, BTCD is in Java, uh, I mean it is in Go, um, Bitcoin is in uh, JavaScript. You don't have to contribute to a single thing, and a lot of these projects are like unmaintained in large part because there aren't enough developers. So you want to get into it and get some cred and become a part of this community, you can totally do that. So it seems like um, we have different projects, uh, blockchains and coins, and the most of reason that they're trying to develop another blockchain is to develop decentralized apps. So it's simply like block Bitcoin blockchain is not, I, I guess it's not fast enough to hold any applications yet. So what's your, on your thoughts? Do you think it's a good way to like develop uh, blockchains for the de decentralized apps? I think most of them are completely useless. And the reason they're making their own quote unquote blockchain is to scam a lot of people out of money. Uh, like try and raise like billions of dollars on like a white paper. They're not gonna make anything, man. Like, I, I mean, like I, the, the day they release something that's actually useful is the day that pigs fly. It, it's not gonna happen. Uh, like, it, like a lot of these things, like, you know, they, they have high ideals or whatever, but you need, I've been part of startups for like 20 years, man. And you need some pressure, you need some forcing function. You need, you need pressure in order for 
things to work. And uh, a lot of these ICOs, they have like millions and millions of dollars. They don't need to work. And you know, like at some point, maybe you start running out of money, uh, and then you like, oh, well, it was a good ride though. Like, I, I can't see that. Like, a lot of these things like claim to be able to do things that are like not possible, um, and uh, they promise whatever to get people to invest in uh, in there, and and they're optimized to get people to give them money. Uh, so I I remain very very skeptical. Um, the first utility token that's actually utilized by anybody other than the holders of the coin uh, <laughs> that got in on the ICO will be the first. So I, I, I remain skeptical, and a lot of these decentralized apps I don't see very much use for. Uh, who knows, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, until I see a use case and given the history of scamming in this industry, I think I'm right to be skeptical. Okay, uh, when we hear you about your skepticism over the altcoins and all those dApps, I mean, like, something just came into my mind. Do you have other coins other than Bitcoin? And if you do so, then, I mean, for people, how are we able to differentiate between the ones that are actually really good and the ones that are scam? Yeah, and this is something that I talked about today, which is... Uh, don't invest in things that you don't understand, man. Most people do that, and uh, and you know what happens? You don't understand it, so you have zero conviction about what it is, and then you like you sell in a panic because you don't understand what the hell it is that you invested in. This is what causes bubbles to form when you aren't informed, when you're ignorant about what you're investing in. You want to be informed. You want to have conviction. Uh, I do have other coins, uh, and, and there are three projects that I always tell people are very interesting, and it's because I've studied them. Monero, Zcash, and Decred. I have, re I have enormous respect for those three projects because I know they're developers. They're really good developers. I, I, uh, you know, uh, Decred's developers uh, uh, did uh, BTCD. I know all of those guys. They're old school OpenBSD guys. They're like super into security. They know what the hell they're doing. Uh, you know, uh, Monero guys, all those guys, like, if you look at the Monero code base, it is completely different than Bitcoin. Unlike, uh, you know, say, like, Feathercoin or something, which is, like, 99% Bitcoin and 1%, like, tweets, Monero is 100% different than Bitcoin. Even their base 58 and coding is completely different. Every, every piece of code and how they, and this is why, like, you know, mobile wallets have a tough time integrating mo, uh, Monero because it's just so different. You can't tweak a parameter and say, we now support Monero. It's, it's, it's extremely difficult for that reason. Zcash is very similar, right? Zero knowledge proofs are a very interesting innovation uh, and, and enhances privacy. And uh, Zuko knows what the hell is he's doing with the cryptography. But you know, vast majority of these other coins, they don't have good developers. They don't know what the hell they're doing. And in order to know that, you have to know what the product is. You have to know what your investment is. And this is why I think like people in Korea, they invested in some ICO that they didn't understand. They got out as soon as it started dropping, didn't they? Right? That's what happens when you don't have conviction. That's what happens when you didn't actually do your research. That's what happens when you're just being greedy. That's, you know, the word investment comes from an old French word about investments. Those are clothing, okay? Investments means that you put it on yourself, right? It becomes a part of you. And otherwise, you're just gambling. You want it to become a part of you. You want to know it so well that you believe in it. You have an investment thesis instead of, I'm just going to put some money and see what the hell happens. That's how you get killed as an investment, okay? You want to know, and that's very important. And that's something that uh, your viewers, frankly, need to learn about. Um, something that I think a lot of people like people might be saying that you're an ICO hater or something, but Definitely I mean, so. <laughs> we, we know by we know factually that you are a venture partner over at blockchain capital. I so am. my question, my question now is because you take such a conservative stance on mm -hmm. the things that you invest, like, mm -hmm. and there's, and there's an onslaught of ICOs. What are 
what kind of projects do you have your eyes peeled open for when you take a very conservative stance to things? Well, so I like I said that about utility tokens. I think equity tokens actually make some sense because that adds liquidity uh, to something, and it's already sort of like a known uh, thing, right? Like stocks, bonds, things like that. Those are already sort of financial products that already exist. Uh, and they can be made much more efficient and more liquid through the use of some of this technology. Uh, so that that can actually make sense. So um, you know, like to say that I'm an ICO hater wouldn't necessarily be true. It could you could have an ICO for an existing business where you're giving away equity, and then uh, and then you know you you allow liquidity by uh, by letting people do things like that. Uh, you know, venture capitalists. Uh, you know, if you if you invest in a fund. You know, it takes like seven or eight years, oftentimes, to get that money back because there's no liquidity event in there. Uh, but you know, with uh, with uh, some sort of token or with liquidity, that that that's now possible. So there there can be innovation in this area. As far as like what what I keep my eyes peeled for is genuine innovation, is really good developers, uh, is good code, it's uh, technological um, competence. Uh, actual security, uh, you know, thinking through game theory, stuff like that. Those are the important things because if you if you design an incentive structure wrong, uh, man, you're not going to have a very good time in this space because people will abuse the hell out of it. So uh, those are the things I look for uh, as a newly minted, not knowing what the hell he's doing VC that I am. Um, I feel that. What you said, it seemed like we are back at square one with, you know, like the traditional VC thing is, oh, we invest in the right people, right? You invest in the yeah. right people with the right ideas. And um, I, I feel that, you know, I I've recently I've become really discouraged because I feel that now picking out technically solid teams seems irre irrelevant game theoretically. If you're in it to make the money, it's much, it might, it might be much more profitable to follow the crowd and the latest uh, shining stuff. So what's your, what's your take on it? Well, that works until it doesn't. <laughs> and like you, you, you could, you could do that, and then follow the crowd, follow the crowd, follow the crowd, and then there's a giant crash, right? This is what a black swan is, or a giant disordering event. Uh, you know, and this, this is what this is the thing that bubbles are made out of is greed, uh, and and especially with ICOs, you have greed on both sides. Greed on greed on the part of the issuers. That are saying, okay, why well, we can get free money without giving up any equity? Read on the part of the buyers that are saying, well, I can make three times my money in about two weeks. That's how bubbles form. And what ha what happens to bubbles? They pop, and they're popping right now. And uh, you're going to see a bloodbath on some of this stuff that's unprecedented, and people are going to lose a lot of money, and they're going to swear it off because they invested in something that they didn't understand. This is why I say you learn what the hell it is that you're investing in, right? Like, have some knowledge about this stuff because if you don't know, you're gonna get burned on this stuff. And uh, you know, following the crowd works until it doesn't, and then that's usually when a lot of people get burned. So, you know, I, I I'm a conservative investor in that regard. You could gamble, and I don't know if you're a gambler, you're probably like really into trading, and there there is sort of like a discipline around that. What people end up doing, though, is that they don't know who they are. They don't know if they're a trader or a long-term investor. Traders are characterized by getting in and out of positions multiple times a day, and often most of them go to sleep having closed all of their positions. Uh, and long-term investors just hold. A lot of people are in, in between when they don't know anything about their investment, and they're the people that get killed. You're the sheep that get slaughtered by the traders. Uh, so you, you follow the crowd at your own peril. Uh, that's a very dangerous game to play. But I don't know. Maybe 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 you're one of the few that can win. I don't know. Yeah, you heard it. You heard it here, folks. Like know yourself uh, by Jimmy Saw. Um, with uh, with the Block Swan event, let's talk about Black Cats just okay. really quickly. Again, again, <laughs> again, a VC thing. Crypto Kitties just acquired twelve million dollars as funding. And so you, you know I gotta put you on the spot. Uh -huh. um, there was you know like there was counterparty counterparty uh -huh. with the rare pay uh -huh. cards and everything, uh -huh. and and there were a lot of applications that got passed over, right? And they uh -huh. chose 
crypto kitties out of all of those what do you think they're gonna do with 12 million dollars of funding you reckon i don't know i i guess you'd have to ask the crypto kitties people uh i mean it, it's it's a fun project you know collectible things on the blockchain and you can prove that if they're super scarce or whatever um and they're unique or whatever like that i I, I, I guess they're investing in the team, uh, kind of like what you were saying. Um, and, you know, they, they do have very interesting people in that thing. You know, they came up with a new concept, so you got to give them credit for that. Um, you know, and there, there is sort of like this push towards like blockchain gaming, uh, where you have provably scarce things. Um, but, you know, a lot of these things are, decentral are, are not decentralized, right? Like you have a central issuer of this stuff. Uh, cause you have to pay to get your crypto kitty from that company. Uh, now is that going to last forever? I don't know. Uh, is it going to be like magic, the gathering cards where, you know, a lot of people sort of get into it and it, it sustains itself in many years. I don't know, maybe, uh, but you know, I, 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 it's, it's a decent bet. Uh, you know, I wouldn't ever bet against like what NGs and Horowitz do. Uh, you know, they, they, they know what the hell they're doing as VCs. And they're certainly much more experienced than I am. So uh, I'm not going to put it past them. But, you know, what are they going to do? They're uh, like like a lot of VC-funded uh, startups. They're probably going to invest in more developers and more ideas and, like, uh, see what the hell sticks. Um, and that's what that's what startups do. They, they try a lot of different things that they think might work. And then if something works, then they keep going and put more resources into that. So... That's what I think will happen. So for general investors, uh, you said the main thing about Bitcoin is decentralization. But from the uh, regular investors, it seems like you know the core developer for Bitcoin is like the center of the Bitcoin network. Uh -huh. What do you think? Well, um, so core developers are a very different lot, right? Like there's and there's not like one set of core developers. There's a lot of them, and they have very, very strong and different opinions. You can't like just say core developers will leave this, core developers will leave that. There's a lot of them, and they all have different opinions, and they they come from all sorts of different backgrounds. They're college dropouts. There are people with PhDs. There are people that uh, have been in the industry for a while. There's like a you know a 17 year old uh, Andrew Chow, right? He he um, contributed as a 17 year old. Uh, Matt Corallo, who contributed as an 18 year old. Uh, there are people that are like in their 50s. Uh, there's the GNU radio guy. He uh, he's like done to tons of stuff in his uh, time, and you know he's contributed to Bitcoin Core. So you know to say that they're like a centralized party is uh, kind of misleading, because you have a lot of different people, and they all believe different things, right? And uh, and they get into a lot lots of arguments, right? Like drive chains is one of them. Uh, you know, like Paul Stork, uh, you know, he, he proposed that Adam Back thinks one thing, Peter Todd thinks something else, uh, Luke Dash Jr. thinks blocks should get smaller. Uh, you know, there, there are other people that think, no, we should probably increase block size or whatever. It's a lot of different opinions. So it's not centralized in any shape. And of course, you, you're, you're very free to go and run another full node. You can use Live Bitcoin, you can use BTCD, you can use Bitcoin. And those, those have their own projects and they can do whatever the hell they want. So I see that as a strength of Bitcoin, uh, you know, multiple implementations, lots of different developers that are all sorts of uh, different places. So, you know, I, that's, that's my answer. I, I, I don't think it's centralized in that way. Okay. Um, call a, I have a question from the audience. So some people are asking about blockchain versus Tangle versus Hashgraph. Thoughts? Uh, I haven't studied Tangle, but Hashgraph looks like uh, some sort of like trusted mempool. Uh, first of all, you shouldn't trust the mempool at all. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, like you shouldn't trust other things. Uh, it, it's, it's a very, it, it assumes that it's not an adversarial network. As far as I could tell, um, and yeah, I mean, I, I know they're getting some insane valuation or whatever from uh, some people I know, but I don't think it's very useful. Um, so a lot of a uh, lot of new investors in this thing, right? Like, there's a lot of people that previously didn't have what you would what a VC would call deal flow, 
that through ICOs, they're getting something like it. Um, and they just want to invest in everything. Uh, once these projects start, fail to deliver, I think people are going to start being more discerning. But right now, we're still in that mania where people will just invest in anything because they haven't had the opportunity before. Uh, and they're get, finally getting some deal flow out of ICOs. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't think either of those are that great. Um, I mean, granted, I haven't looked at Tangle that much, but I think it's based on a lot of, like, DAGs or something like that. Um, but yeah, it's uh, I, like it, a lot of it, it seems to be adding unnecessary complexity or uh, sort of stupidity to a lot of this stuff. We'll see, though. I, I, I'm, I'll fully admit I might be wrong. If they prove me wrong, I'll apologize. But, you know, uh, the, my assessment comes from uh, years of watching this space and the lack of delivery of a lot of these promises for a lot of projects. Yeah, I heard uh, one of my friends say that a lot of people in the space love writing white, paper, white papers, but they don't really like sitting down and coding. Um, yeah. And, and we have, a, a, and we're gonna try to wrap up today's interview with a, just a set of questions about Lightning Network, which is, okay. you know, it's actually one of those that people, someone actually wrote a white paper and they actually implemented it. So uh -huh. how effective do you think Lightning Network will be? My personal opinion is that, you know, honestly, there aren't that many microtransactions. They all kind of disappeared from Bit from Bitcoin because of the high transaction costs. But uh, do you think that that the scaling effect um, that the Lightning effect Lightning Network will give is will be a lot, or will it will it be minuscule? Well, um, so if you've done any studying of like uh, the capabilities of Lightning, yeah, I, you can get something like the order of magnitude, or like ten thousand times the throughput. Uh, through usage of Lightning Network. Um, uh, I, like, what, what's it going to actually be like? I don't know. Um, like I mentioned with Gresham's Law, that still holds true on Lightning. If you have good money and bad money, you're going to use the bad money. Uh, that's just a uh, reality. And, you know, you, you don't want to repeat the same thing that I did with beef jerky, right? Like, or the sewing machine I bought my wife, right? Like, that's like a $5,000 sewing machine or something, right? Like, you don't want to do that, um, and uh, and that's going to tr stay true if you use Lightning or on-chain transactions or whatever. It it's uh, so that that's my skepticism on Lightning. The actual technology is absolutely solid, as far as I can tell. Now the attack surface is very different, and the security model is different. So you have to do you have to account for that, and that's why it's still beta software. And people are going to try different things and try to find use cases. This is a beautiful part of Bitcoin is that if you're an entrepreneur and you can find some use case and utilize this thing and like get people to use it, you can make a lot of money. Uh, you know, instead of like doing useless things like create like useless ICOs or some bad 90s like dot com idea and bolting a blockchain and a token to it. Uh, you know, you could you could actually like do stuff like on Lightning that that might that people might actually do. You still might fail. But at least you're trying to move the art forward instead of uh, doing something kind of useless. And at least you're trying to like add something to uh, the ecosystem of Bitcoin instead of doing something useless. Even every failure sort of adds knowledge to the ecosystem, and that's a good thing. Uh, so that's what I would encourage uh, those uh, aspire to create startups and things do instead of. Uh, you know, a lot of what they're tempted to do, which is to sell their soul for an ICO payout. Uh, and, uh, and you know, it's very tempting, but man, you, sell, you, you get to sell your soul only once. That's all I'll say about that. I think uh, ICOs are a great business model. It's the business mo model of the future that we never recognized. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, sorry about that. Uh, but is for Lightning Network, it's, right? So it's in beta, it's in mainnet. Like, you know, people people were using it re regardless of the fact that that was a main, whether it was on mainnet or not, they hacked their way into it. But is beta, is is what we see in Lightning Network, do you think it's good enough when it comes to currency? Because otherwise, like other software, right? Once it's in beta, it's pretty good. You could, you could, you could use it like pretty depend, you could depend on it. But in terms of beta, when it comes to currency, like just one mistake and you'll have your funds like disappear into thin air. Yeah, yeah, it's not a website, right? Like, I, and people are sort of like web development timeframes. You can't make a freaking cryptocurrency in six weeks, okay? Like you can with a website because you have much higher security thresholds. 
you can't you can't just like uh, you know you have a you have you make a mistake on a website you get a 404 you make a mistake on Bitcoin somebody loses like 10 million dollars you, you can't do that so it's very important that people recognize that the thresholds of development are much much higher you have to think in terms of like NASA level security where you have to prove uh, the security of something and that's that tends not to be the case uh, with a lot of these uh, projects frankly uh, but yeah I mean uh, going forward uh, you know like what's gonna happen with the security of these things and how are, how are people I, I don't know uh, we'll, we'll see but you know they, these are some hard lessons that people are gonna have to learn yeah Meg Choi uh, one of the viewers that are watching she's asking that is the is the reason Bitcoin development is the reason that it takes such a long time because you know all the Bitcoin core developer Bitcoin developers have different thoughts and then they're also having to prioritize all of these thoughts and then all, they're also having to reach consensus on the, that and add add to the fact that you just mentioned NASA level security is that is yeah, that a yeah. proper assessment yeah yeah so the there's uh, the whole process is like this you you have an idea, you make a pull request, and then it has to get reviews. And if it's cr consensus critical, it, it needs to get a lot of review uh, because you don't want to miss anything. You want to uh, assess every sort of low probability scenario and things like that. So it becomes like this, uh, this very laborious process where every line of code has to like, uh, like go through a security review. So it's very, uh, it is very difficult, um, and you know, uh, and every line of code has to go through uh, checks that a lot of um, people are not necessarily used to, especially if you come from like the web development world, where it's just like code review is somebody just checking a box. Uh, you know, code review in Bitcoin is very much more strict than that. So, yeah, it, it's uh, you know, that's open source development for you, especially with like high secu highly secure things. Is that you 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 need a lot of review. Um, uh, so yeah, that that's a major part of it. Uh, you know, sometimes getting to consensus on uh, on changes is a lot a large part of it. Uh, but yeah, it, it really depends on each particular pull request. Uh, but yeah, uh, like Segwit, for example, took forever because uh, there, were, there were a lot of there was a lot of review required. There's a lot of coaching, uh, um, and that that's to be expected. So, yeah, uh, that that is why I, I would say that's a very good chance. Uh, yeah, Jimmy, thank you so much for your input today. Uh, I think right now it's right about like 12, 12 a.m. here in Korea, yeah. and it is about like eleven a.m. Uh, eleven is it eleven a.m. Yeah. 11 a.m. in the New York time. Oh, 11, 11 a.m. in New York time. Like everyone's in it right now. And thank you so much for your views on it. And thank you so much for your time. Because like it seems like there are a lot of people around you having so much fun. We can hear your background <laughs> sound right now. <laughs> Even though your friends are having a great time. Thank you so much for having a time with us. And if you hey, can make it. Man, what's more fun to talk? It's yeah, yeah. So if you can like make a last comment to Bitcoin users that are watching right now, then it will be a lot of help. Yeah, I hey guys, like uh, know your investment, study this stuff. This is how you become a good uh, sort of citizen of Bitcoin. You don't want to be that ignorant guy that doesn't understand anything and just follows the crowd. Okay, go learn something, build something. Be, become valuable to the community instead of being a freeloader. Okay, uh, and that is something that anyone can aspire to, even if you're not a developer, at least learn something about the economics, learn something about uh, how things work and what you can do. Ask not what Bitcoin can do for you, ask what you can do for Bitcoin. Is, is your speaking ability coming from your cowboy hat? <laughs> I think so, I think yeah. so. I think you should wear that all the time. <laughs> I do, I do. Yeah, Austin represent. Part of my brand now at this point, yeah. Yep. Anyways, yeah. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, if you like this video, if you like this interview, please hit like, comment, or subscribe. And um, this was this is uh, CN from the Blockchainers and Tristan from Blog Arts and Tony. And then and then we had Jimmy. And this song is done, baby. Done. All right, all right. All Have right. fun in Hong Kong, Jimmy. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Jimmy. All right, see you guys. Mm -hmm. Yo, yo, bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>